Ertz and I'm the Autistic Director of the National Youth Jazz Collective. Welcome to our hashtag National Youth Jazz Wednesday, our weekly check-in with people on the scene, artists, educators, uh, promoters and alumni as well, just to see what sort of things are going on and often have themes to talk about. So this week I'm really thrilled that our theme is to help all the young musicians who are thinking to audition next uh, term for Conservatoire. And we're really thrilled to have two really uh, significant members of the faculty who've helped MIJC become the organisation it is. So I'd like to give a really hearty welcome please from the Royal Academy of Music for Nick Smart. And from the Royal Birmingham Conservatoire, we've got Jeremy Price. Hello, both of you. Hi. Hi. So I really appreciate you coming in to talk to us. And just to say to everybody that's watching, if you've got any general questions about specifically uh, to do with uh, auditioning for the two colleges, the other conservatoires will be joining us next week when we do our mini summer school online. So do tune in again next Thursday, a week tomorrow. But um, today it'd be really lovely to talk to you both about the Academy and the Conservatoire. And I'd like to start off, I think, first of all, so uh, about the, the two courses and what the main structure of it is, so uh, Birmingham and the Academy. So maybe we start with Nick first, if you could give us a bit of an outline, first of all, because I know from having been involved in all the courses, there are there's lots of common ground and there's lots of differences. And, and the nice thing is there are enough places to go around for everyone. So I think it's really important that everybody gets an insight into what the programmes all involve, because um, yeah. they're all very special. So over to you, Nick. Well, thank you very much for having me, first of all, and um, welcome everybody. Yeah, I, I mean, I guess feel free to ask uh, specific questions if I happen to not cover anything. But we, it's a fairly small department, about 45, 50 in total, with uh, the usual four-year bachelors and, and two-year masters. And we try to make as welcoming and, a, and kind of supportive community-based environment as possible. And the, I guess the ethos I'm sure we're all going for is to to try and make sure that graduates are equipped as artistically as possible and also as professionally as possible so that they can uh, think about making their way in the world with some solid career skills as, as well as their own artistic endeavours. But there's a, a really fantastic compositional focus for us at the heart of the the program that has a wonderful um, kind of community effect because once people as you know yourself once people are composing for each other it sort of fast tracks those musical relationships and makes friendships and connections much more deeply so uh, so that's a, a big thing and then probably the the standard uh, jazz course things you'd expect to see like history and rhythmic skills and studying the you know the tradition the african-american tradition of the music and uh, um, big band projects alongside small ensemble projects and things like that brilliant and i'll come back to ask you a few questions in a moment it's really mm. nice to get that general overview first of all so jeremy might you do the same thing to introduce us to the the birmingham conservatoire royal birmingham conservatoires program yeah sure um yeah thanks again izzy for asking me on so it's really nice to be You're here welcome. it's lovely to see you both yeah uh, myjc super important organization and uh, it's a, a great link between people who have sort of spread across the country beavering away in isolation to uh, get their jazz together and then they have a collective thing here which can re really successfully bridges the gap between that area and the conservatoire life and then onto the profession so it's a it's a great organization um, so yeah, just some broad brush comments about um, conservatoires uh, in jazz. Um, I think uh, we're relatively newcomers to to uh, the conservatoire scene uh, relative to classical music. So uh, we've been around since 1999, and I think Graham Collier started the course a little bit earlier um, at the academy. Um, but it's been a great evolution and um you know we're, we're all thoroughly accepted parts of the musical fabric now um so yeah it's uh, similar to what nick was saying i mean it's really important that the courses support um the artistic creative side um so we're not just a professional training we're very much nurturing the creative artistic side and everything we do has to be geared around that there's a huge amount of choice student choice 
Um, I think a nice way to describe it is that, you know, very often people ask us what our curriculum is. And uh, it, it re really isn't a list that we could send you. It's um, basically the student is the curriculum is quite a good way to look at it because both myself and Nick and our departments, we will come around and facilitate what you want to do uh, musically. Uh, that's not to say that you're left alone completely to your own devices and you just sort of float around and we, we uh, let you get access to the studio or something. There's definitely a lot of advice there. And we, uh, uh, we understand that the people are at really different levels and there are certain skills that we know that all jazz musicians have together. You know, they know core repertoire, they know changes, they know various uh, language and skills orientated things. So if they, if we feel that they're missing, we definitely come around and, and there's a there's a real good structure to get hold of, to learn all those really important areas. But um, I think the most important thing is please don't think that it's some kind of um, some sign of one size fits all. Mm -hmm. uh, it's definitely you come in at your level and and you and you gravitate towards certain members of staff because we we've both got very large. Uh, faculties of visiting tutors and guest artists and things so you can gravitate towards people who are really into the similar sort of areas of music so you can gravitate towards someone who's really inspiring to you in particular so um uh and yeah there's a really important compositional part of all conservatoire programs in jazz and that's really important so composition uh, improvisation are very closely related in terms of um, them being uh, productive things for musical artists to do. So then, so I don't rabbit on too much and we can move on to Izzy's next question. I'm going to say probably the most important thing that we prepare people for uh, all conservatoire jazz courses is that we're, um, you know, just have an idea of what you think a creative entrepreneur is. Because the, the, the diverse careers that people end up doing, uh, well, there are as many different types of career as there are people who've done the courses really so you you choose your path within a creative area of music so and you'll typically be doing lots of different things across lots of different areas some you know from arts administration to uh, a, a composition commission to uh, being a session musician a studio artist being a side musician being a band leader um, teaching obviously uh, getting involved in jazz education, uh, being part of a, an organisation such as such as this, or or other sort of more um, uh, other established uh, uh, things on the scene. So that there's it's it's really broad, and uh, and the type of music that people pursue is is very broad as well. So and and it's definitely our job to make sure that we're we're not corralling you into one area. We're presenting. A broad range of opportunities when you've chosen those then we can come around that and help that. I'm thinking there are sort of two ways of looking at the music one is the historic because we are now over 100 years old you know and they've got a long legacy and I'd like to maybe talk about the legacy in a little while because also I know it's very important for both of you to remain in touch with the current scene and the sort of the current heartbeat of what's happening in the contemporary music that's going on. So I'm wondering whether I could invite uh, both of you to give some examples of sort of projects that you've been running in your departments that is championing the music of current composers. And I wondered if we could start with Nick first. Yeah, of course. Um, well, I mean, quite a lot of the projects are about uh, or being led by living composers in January thankfully before uh, everything kind of locked down we had our week of uh, uh, like an ECM festival and Craig Taborn was in working on with his own music and so was Anders Jormin and Kit Down so there's there's quite a lot of um, uh, of work done because the, in a way the people who are practitioners today represent at least one of the options that the the students themselves could be kind of striving for in the future and and I particularly love it when people have this connection to the the history and the lineage of jazz it's one of the greatest privileges to uh, uh, about the music of which we're a part is that 
you are a connection to uh, to some of the masters of of the founders of the music, you know, and it's uh, whatever you're doing now. If you're playing jazz with a rhythm section, you're you're in that lineage, whether you like it or not. So it's it's kind of beholden on you to give it the respect and the study that it that it deserves, and and then move it forward in your own way. So we're I, we're fully in support of of all of that from uh, from the roots and the the old masters up to what's happening right now you know and i love that idea of uh, wanting to broker relationships not just a uh, sort of student tutor relationship but prospectively sort of working on projects together in the future that it because there is the we are very cross generational in, in the community the way we work it's lovely that the way that you're approaching it is developed is taking that forward into the yeah. course itself it's brilliant yeah so um, Jeremy, my, it would be lovely to hear some examples of some of the current contemporary projects that have been going on in Birmingham as well. So, and I know that you've recently changed, moved venues. Uh, you moved from where you were based near the, in the sort of centre of Birmingham. Now you're with the Birmingham City University and um, I think you've got a bit more space. You've even got your own jazz club. Yeah, we've got the, the new building now. We've been in since 2017. So that's a, a major upgrade in the facilities we've got five amazing performing spaces and uh yeah so we're trying to use the um use the club as a as a as a real offer to the city as well and and the region and the uk you know to trying to make sure that that's a really significant part of the scene and it's on everybody's radar um so uh we've tried to integrate you know one, one of the things we say is that like the the course is the club and the club is the course it's a it should be one and the same. So a lot of the student um, activity feeds through into performances at the club, uh, usually support bands for major artists who are visiting. But also the, the guest artist masterclass series, which has always been really strong at Birmingham. But we've now managed to migrate that into something uh, that's also a, a, a public facing gig. So for instance, you know, if we have Dick Oates in for a masterclass, then he'll come and He'll, he'll work with the students in the afternoon and then they do a support band slot for him and then he he um, performs that evening in the club and we, we do that with a whole procession of people almost on a weekly basis and uh, sometimes we do co-promotions with um, with Tony Dudley Evans or um, uh, Jazz Lines uh, who are the main promoter in Birmingham so um so that's how we connect in with the, you know, coming back to your initial point, Izzy, about um, uh, contemporary composition. I mean, it's, it's really important all, all conservatoire courses will have really good connections with the, the wider scene, you know, the, the top level professional scene. And uh, we get them in the building and, and they feel part of the fabric. They're very integrated. So it's not just, uh, it's not really just passing through. They're really part of the fabric for that time that they're, they're with us and the students get, uh, you know, it's, it, for them, it's not like a, a gig series necessarily because they, they really do get to know these people and they get to play with them. So uh, that's, um, that's super important. I think uh, one, one of the things that comes out of the conversations that we often have with non-jazz musicians is that they're very aware of sort of the social side of things and that we're very sociable and that it seems to be such an important part of, of the scene and, and how we are all hanging together and working together. But I think sometimes the sort of the reason for that gets missed and we're just seen as, you know, a big sort of a cohort of very sociable people, but there's, it, it goes deeper than that, doesn't it? And the music itself really depends on it and grows from it. And I wondered um, whether Jeremy might sort of explain that side of things a little bit more about how important that side of things is to the music, not just that we do a gig and then have a lovely hang, but that yeah. connection is actually what makes the music. Mm. Yeah, I mean, it's a professional development thing, really, uh, to to use uh, probably too academic a word for something that's been going on for for, for decades. But, you know, that, that social scene is really, really important. The networking, uh, really getting to know somebody. It just, But also, um, I hope this doesn't sound too patronising to novice jazz musicians, but just being able to handle yourself around really quite heavy people. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a really. I can remember when I was younger. It was it was always quite intimidating to meet someone who who you had always revered greatly, and uh, and I think if if you have people who are revered greatly and they're around you a, a lot, 
then it, you can feel a lot more comfortable in coming up to them and asking them a question and 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 getting a direct answer and 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 then I think that that travels through also into your first professional experiences suddenly you'll be bounced into a band people who are highly experienced and they know each other really well and that the social situation can be a little bit awkward or intimidating but actually if you're acclimatized that through your conservatoire and you've had all this hanging out with people and you're used to chatting to people on the bandstand after a gig and things then it just it makes you that much more sort of mobile and good at, and natural at networking rather than the networking being forced mm. so, um, you know um, we're all encouraged to network we can feel ever so false sometimes but yeah. i think that you know conservatories really give you that lovely bridge into just mm. being able to be self-assured when you're talking to mm. someone who's got a huge reputation and really mature and and, and you highly revere them so that's I'm wondering with that all three of us are in a position where we're working with that age group where some people we notice that some of the young musicians very naturally uh, uh, don't struggle with putting themselves forward in a, you know always in a very generous and kind way but they, they don't mind putting themselves forward introducing themselves to people you know approaching them about ideas and, the, and there is always amongst them some very strong musicians who do struggle and they are shy and I'm just wondering Nick if you might sort of share any insights into sort of advice that you might have given to some of the young musicians about how it's okay to put yourself forward and it's actually part of what we're all doing and want to do. Yeah, I, and, and to uh, follow on, uh, to connect what Jeremy was saying with what you've just asked, it it's about the, um, this is the extremely human music, the, the, the connection between the people playing is is totally alive because of the improvisation and the interaction perhaps more than in any other music in my relatively limited experience at least this is something completely unique to us and absolutely joyful so all, all of the socializing aspect or of a you know the people to people uh, communication that goes along with the music try to see it as as an extension of the same thing and and the better those relationships are between one another the more that will will come out in the musical connections on stage and then it stops being like a thing that you're supposed to do or uh, you know that i just find that to be a a much more natural and and, and it's true i don't think it's a technique it's it, i think that is the way and when you're lucky enough to be around as thanks to NYJC, we all have somebody as mega as as Dave Holland. You, the first thing you're struck by is just what a completely beautiful, warm, humble person that that I remember on one of the NYJC summer schools. The first thing he said is, I, "Like I don't want you to treat me differently. We're all on the same journey. We just might be at different points along." the same path but it, it you know it was such a, a kind of leveling thing and I think sometimes with with young musicians getting into jazz because undeniably there are technical aspects to the music like there is anything sport anything that it's it, it, you can be lulled into thinking that a good performance is something where you've proved something or that kind of thing and that can then get intimidating and just try to put that to one side and, and be honest and be welcoming and know that people will recognise that. Make no mistake about it. If you get up and have all the chops in the world and sound killing, that's fantastic and it's to be applauded for the work it took to achieve and, it, and it's they're absolutely necessary skills. But if you've got some character and some vulnerability and some you know beauty and fragility there's everyone's going to spot that so don't ever be afraid to to just be yourself and uh, and and go and put yourself forward on that basis not on a, a competitive basis the I, fact you've even chosen this path for yourself says more about you than anything else could ever 
Absolutely. And one of the things, because you, as you both know, we normally have a tutorial with each of the youngsters. So that's a really lovely opportunity to, to talk to them just one to one myself and sort of see where they're at and what they, what they any help they need, any sort of ambitions they've got that they're not quite sure how to go about doing things. And sometimes the youngsters will say, I don't think I'm as good as the others because I don't play like X. And I actually say, and I know the, the two of you would say a similar thing if you were talking to them, which is, well, you can see that both ways. You can see it as a strength and you can see it as a weakness because who wants everyone to sound like X in the same group? And that's the beauty of the music. We, if we're all so different, then that's what brings the music together. It's those differences. And it's very difficult to measure as well. So which brings me on to the next question. If it's so difficult to measure, how can one audition? <laughs> and so I'm wondering, first of all, Jeremy, whether you might tell us what the audition requirements are to get into Birmingham. And then um, and then sort of you because I've noticed that you sometimes you're very good at um, we talk a lot, all three of us about, you know, when you feel that somebody's already there and others you can see that they've got potential and, and both of those are really important to you in your decision making so first of all what are the requirements to get into the Birmingham Royal Birmingham Conservatoire? Uh, well uh, there's an audition list and uh, everything will be up on the website so if you have a look and we expect you to play something from our list which will be standards and that's just a way of steering people towards the fact that you know uh, uh, all jazz musicians no standards so we expect you to be on your way uh, on that journey of investigation um, and then the second piece is a completely free choice so uh, um, yeah, so that's usually very revealing to see what what else you'd like to present and uh, then we also ask for a transcription uh, so um, uh, people present those in a whole myriad of forms sometimes people just play from memory and they've mm -hmm. never had written it down and some people have a whole book of stuff that they've written down and sometimes they read it sometimes they've got them from memory sometimes people get them from the internet and that's fine so it's like it's just really interesting to see how you've approached the request to present a transcription so it just is quite revealing about the way you study and that sort of thing but uh, and then um, all the auditions are with live musicians uh, and so um we're probably going to have to suspend that for the first time ever this November, uh, but we will do a live interview. Um, and then who knows, you know, because it's such a movable feast at the time, isn't it? But mm. um, at this time, but I mean, um, if if we get the glimmer of an opportunity to have you in the building and playing with the live rhythm section, mm -hmm. I bet we'll certainly be right there <laughs> making sure that that happens. So if we, it's just a question of permission, you know, if we get permissions to do that, then we'll, we'll be there. Um, but uh, yeah, we would encourage you to send in a video of you playing with other musicians, uh, because as Nick said, you know, it's like it's the live interaction between human beings. that's the most important thing. So um, and just seeing how you are amongst uh, people. But, but normally you'll play with a, a student rhythm section and uh, and you'd get a, a chance to rehearse with them before your audition. You come in. So so uh, and then what we're looking for uh we're just looking for people who've um already started engaging in the process of getting a, a the best musician that they possibly can be so um that, that's as as much as i can say really because the, the the level is is very broad and the the musical background is very broad we're all some of our own musical experiences so it's just uh, seeing where you've come from we do look very closely at the background of people um, uh, some people have had a huge amount of help and a great opportunity so uh, to be frank we would expect those people to have, have made a lot of that opportunity so if you've been on a you know wonderful summer school or such so then we'd have hoped that you know and that was a year or so ago we'd, we'd expect a certain level um, if you've been working away in isolation and uh, you haven't really had much of a chance just because of your geography or your postcode, you know, uh, or whatever may be holding you back, we try and peer through that and see how you've worked things out under your own steam. Um, uh, we wouldn't expect you to be of the same level necessarily. Uh, it's Again, it's that journey thing, you know, are you serious about this journey? You know, are you serious about moving forward on it? And that's, you can tell that from an audition. You can, um, 
you know you can you can tease that out and the interview is actually really important we like to get to know you and uh, have a proper chat and the, we do read the personal statements and and the references they are really important to get an overview of uh, of what you like um you know uh, in terms of just uh, your outward projection of what you want to do in your musical life so and and they're a great sort of uh, way to start a proper conversation about you and your musical experiences how you see that fitting in with the conservatoire life and how you see that developing into the future so i hope, hope that's yeah. a reasonable that's overview. really helpful and uh, just wondering when you said about selecting the pieces they do they turn up with the pieces or do they tell you in advance of what their program choice is or is it a case of just arriving on the day with with the they can just arrive on the day and right. uh, the rhythm sections only very occasionally get roasted by something that's really, really difficult. But normally, you know, we've got, we've got a senior rhythm section that's senior student rhythm section that they can handle most things. So, so is your advice to sort of really go down the lead sheet rather than, you know, frantic scored piano parts or? Oh yeah, you, I mean, basically we want to hear you improvise. Yeah, we, and uh, we, we want to, you to understand that in, within the time frame, you know, you're going to be working with a new rhythm section. You can't foist on them some magnum opus you know you, they get, you've got to be realistic about what can be achieved brilliant so and, and if you choose you know choose common repertoire that we're likely to know you know again you know that that will that will reveal to us what cut type of band leader you're likely to be because everyone at all music colleges are, they're all band leaders each player is a band leader so uh, they have to run their own projects so that's you know we, we need you to of, um, had a serious think about how you're going to lead that band when you're uh, applying for, when you're doing your audition how you're going to take your first little rehearsal and how you're going to show show us what you do in the in the actual audition fantastic that's really really helpful thank you lovely and so nick just wondering um, i think well, a, a lot of similarities of course oh. with, with what jeremy said but the um certainly this year of course there's two two things to talk about what would have happened and I don't know if you could see me sort of frantically trying to pull up a word document without being seen doing so of of the audition requirements we're probably going to have to implement uh for a, a video submissions if if getting people in to into the building in December in the quantity that normally happens for auditions might not be possible so but as Jeremy said, we we would hope, if possible, that even a maybe a second round process could be done in person mm. uh, with fewer numbers. But maybe maybe not. We'll we'll just have to see. But luckily, I think probably all of us are, are so experienced now in this process. It I don't see it having any negative impact on anyone. But yeah, ordinarily it would have been a a, a choice of a like a standard and a maybe a ballad to to just show some different sides of your jazz playing and then uh, bringing in a composition of your own um and the interview is super important and we we're not looking for anything to be you know the finished article or anything like that the you it's why the question about what you're looking for is so uh, difficult to answer and and for the students difficult to prepare for because in a sense you're not looking for anything you're reacting to the people that apply and come through the door so that's why you can't really say if you can do x y z and this this and this you're definitely going to get in because it it just is a uh, about the individual and about the the human being and the way they are in ensembles and so uh, I just think, if possible, try not to build it up into this very nerve-wracking sort of heightened uh, one-shot deal. I mean, I know, I get that it is, it's pressured, but what we'd really want to see is you enjoying yourself and, in, and conveying your love of, of music, which is why you're choosing this path. And it's nerve wracking for us. Make no mistake. It's like, well, God, I, you know, I hope we find someone, and I hope it's the right fit, and I hope it's right for them. So, you know, be relaxed and and be confident, and know that it's your decision as much as it is ours. 
and and just present the the best version of yourself that that you can just wondering um time wise sort of roughly how much time do you do you is is the audition how long are the auditions and also the preparation with the rhythm section as well because sometimes time management i think is quite to remain relaxed and feeling that you can really blossom it's good to know what your parameters are so i'm sure it's in the requirements but um nick how long is the actual audition itself well they end up being about there's normally two two parts to it there's the the part where you present the the two standards and then a second part where you um uh, bring the composition in and do the interview so the, you probably end up with 25 minutes half an hour across the whole thing and and the candidates end up chatting with the band outside the room and and going through their chart but normally it's always student ensembles accompanying and they're such for the most part fantastic readers and, and used to interpreting compositions because that's what they do as part of the course that there's there's never a problem and we make it clear that we're not assessing the the like our own students ability to sight read your chart so just relax treat it like a rehearsal it's it's not a recording session it's it's just a process and the beginnings of an insight into you showing us some of your your thoughts and ideas as a writer you know and also you're not there to criticize you're really, like you say you're rooting for them you're hoping that absolutely yeah yeah that's part of that Brilliant. Jeremy, how long do you normally allow for the audition? Just this, I think it's really helpful for the youngsters to sort of be able to contextualise that. There's a half an hour warm up with your rhythm section and then um, the audition is normally 20 minutes to 25 minutes, including the interview. Um, right. So, um, yeah, and uh, just to support what Nick was saying there, it's very much a two way process. You know, I mean, uh, uh, we, we try and make it really clear what it would like would be like to study here and we encourage you to have a chat with any students you see and there are tours of the building and that sort of thing and yeah we definitely want the process to be open and friendly and not intimidating that's talking of open because we as we said um when we were first setting up before we went live that you know we don't dwell on covid we only talk about it when it's necessary you know uh, often we're just having a creative conversation with our guests but with um with COVID, I'm wondering if there are still the open days that you've been hosting, or if you've had to do it slightly differently. Um, Nick, our open day is going to be different this year. They've they have made the decision to do these online and and digitally. Yeah. And I guess there's advantages to that that we can reach more people, and the the journey involved is is no longer a problem. And there'll be a, a, a way of still taking questions. And I, I think in a way, a lot of what we cover will be the same. But the, the face to face meeting, unfortunately, because they're, they're so early in the in the term, they're normally end of September time. So that will be too early to be inviting 100 uh, members of the public into the big halls, you know. That's really good to know. We'll mention it next week as well when we do the mini online summer school just remind Brilliant. people about that yeah. and the same with jeremy uh, what, are you staying online for your open day well we actually did an online one in june so oh. we, we do two a year one in january one in june so and you can still see it it's re, all, it was all recorded so you, you're all welcome to log on and have a have a look at our our first attempt at a virtual open day i mean there, were, there wasn't any uh, there wasn't any live playing we didn't manage to to pull that one off but uh, was, but i mean we've got a very active youtube page and you can hear lots of students play it's in a to a similar type of level that um, you would see if you came to our open day concert so mm -hmm. you can get a sense of things there i think there's a virtual tour around the building as well so you can so you can have a, a, some sense of of, um, of what it's like but I mean yeah I mean I would say it's still important to get in that first round of auditions um, so um, even though you know, don't, don't hold your horses for the um, in the hope that you might get the live audition a bit later down the line I yeah. think, I'd say jump in there um, and and basically you can accept your place and you can and then and then let's hope for better times where you can you would be able to before you actually enrolled 
you'd be able to have a really decent look around the building and some face-to-face -face time. So, um, but yeah, the the, um, the virtual open days were were quite good fun. Actually, it's a bit a bit weird. It's a bit like um, university challenge with the us all lined up across the screen. <laughs> All uh, yakking away together, and we invited a load of students on. There's a quite nice. There's a couple of nice student forums where we, the staff, are chatting to the students. So, and that's all up and recorded on webinar. Oh, brilliant! Well, we'll definitely share that. We'll share it through our, our YouTube and our Facebook. But we'll also make sure that during the week itself, we'll point both for, for both you know organisations, both colleges will point it out yeah, so yeah. the youngsters know what's happening we've we've had a question come in and, it, and it's a question that actually is part of a slightly bigger question that i'm often asked as well is that the presumption is that jazz courses are just for what we would call jazz instruments so trumpet saxophone trombone and rhythm section and so there are certain instruments that feel that they're a bit sometimes miscellaneous and that do they actually belong on those courses so we've had a, a message from a, a jazz violinist wondering how welcome are jazz violinists on the jazz program? And is there the opportunity to, um, to, to be joint classical and jazz? So they're kind of two questions. Uh, so maybe first of all, uh, Jeremy. Uh, yeah, we've, had, we've got a reasonable track record, some really excellent jazz violinists actually. And um, uh, we have one from, they are rare, but uh, they're very, very welcome. Uh, we have one from, one who particularly comes to mind is, is from Malaysia, Pai An. Yo, she was great. She did, um, you know, she could fully take part as a, a frontline band leader running her own thing. She did some great um, sort of John Zorn-esque projects and and some really nice uh, Joe Henson transcriptions on violin that sounded mm. amazing. Uh, so yeah, that, that's, um, yeah, violin is, is really welcome. And, uh, but Probably uh, just to say that although, yeah, they are the traditional jazz instruments, aren't they? Trumpet, trombone, saxophone, piano, bass, drums, guitar. But I mean, it, it's about improvising first and foremost. So it's really open. The, the only problem is uh, uh, technical things with um, uh, QCAS forms. You know, your first study might not be listed there, but there are ways around it you can, you know, uh, of just jumping in you give us a call if your instrument's not there and we work something out to make sure you get your audition that's lovely to hear because uh, there was um so uh, i heard of a cellist it was neither of your two colleges but there was a cellist who actually was called to audition and auditioned and played their heart out only to get a letter saying actually we don't take cellos and so they'd actually gone through the whole process right. and then we're told so you know i think we as an organization just want to be bit sort of protective of not, that not happening again and I, I wouldn't imagine for a minute it would happen with either of you but I just thought it it was a lovely question to come in I'm wondering about the Royal Academy and uh, I, th I remember you, there's quite a track record of jazz violinists there too. Well we had a, it, the most recent being a, a postgrad uh, Dan Oates was fantastic who came actually from the classical course uh, at the academy he did the four-year bachelors there but was increasingly drawn towards jazz and that in answer to the other question about that there's not like a pure split course because the the jazz uh, degree is its own beamers so you are either on that or you're on the classical beamers there there isn't a kind of half and half but there is what they call second study provision so you might be able to do something. A lot of the pianists, for instance, have a classical, some of their one-to-one -one hours with a classical teacher, but they're not delving into the uh, uh, repertoire level to the depth that obviously a pure classical student would be, would be doing. Um, so you don't, you don't necessarily have to stop that direction completely, but certainly you're on a jazz BMAS course and that would be the focus but yeah absolutely um the same as as jeremy said it there's no instrument that is off limits if you're improvising and expressing yourself and are in the tradition we consider ourselves to be uh, a part of then you're very welcome and the expectations basically are the same as whatever uh, role in an ensemble you fulfill the the only time it would be an issue would be if uh, 
if say you were doing a, a, a music of a certain composer where the lineup didn't include your instrument but that's true of course in anything if you know if you were doing a a big band that never included guitar then the guitarist wouldn't be in that big band project so there's yeah they'd be uh, they'd be treated the same as anyone and the expectations for entry would be the same as anybody else's nice thing about small group repertoire is that it tends to be less instrument specific doesn't it so yeah. there is that lovely but like you say there will be spe certain bespoke projects but i, I should uh, imagine you would also build the program if you well, had a certain type of instrumentation there you wouldn't fastidiously say, well, we always do these. You would course, be thinking yeah. about that as well. So that's really, really lovely to hear because we have seen a couple of crestfallen youngsters. And, and I have to say, and I'm happy to say this publicly as well, and I know I've got your, both of you, I know I have your full support in saying this. I suddenly thought, well, what am I doing running a National Youth Jazz Collective, advocating, being an advocate for the music and to say, come and be part of it, if then further down the chain, someone is saying sorry you can't come because of the instrument you play then I really had to seriously rethink what we do so that's that's really helpful thank you both um with the postgraduate courses as well because sometimes I think the youngsters are so focused on coming to London and studying or, or going to Birmingham to study at the degree level they don't think about how you know you can pace it and actually there's the further option of actually going to those two cities at postgraduate level not necessarily undergraduate level as well so I'm just wondering Nick whether you might tell us a bit about your postgraduate program and then I will hand over to Jeremy after that. Um, yeah well I mean we get very uh, happily so we have uh, quite a few students coming for the masters who've completed studies at, at one of the other colleges and also who may have studied in uh, you know in Europe or on a on a university uh, academic course where music's just been a thing they've maintained to a very high level so uh, mostly for the postgrad we try to include them in as much of the undergraduate education as possible because that's generally at, at such a high level if if you were to uh, give the postgraduate separate classes there'd be a lot of repetition so they share those some of those things like composition classes and rhythm studies classes actually alongside the uh, the undergraduates and then there's uh, dedicated postgrad you know repertoire things and and again uh, like a composer's octet where they get to be Duke Ellington every every Wednesday evening and and kind of write for one another with Pete Churchill and mm. and have a, a workshop band basically so they're they're a fantastic addition to the the community and the and the atmosphere in the in the department overall. I think sometimes there's a misconception of the sort of the churn. Once you're in a degree level, then basically the postgraduate will be the same person now staying on an extra year or two. And I don't think that's the case, is it? There's... it not, not for us. None of the students uh, who've completed their four years with us then stay on uh, to, do, to do ours. If they were going to do uh, masters, they would normally have gone el elsewhere to do that, you know. Because I think quite a few of them have gone abroad, haven't they? So as well, yeah. so there are, might you give a few examples of where else they might have gone to do the postgraduate? Well, some people have ended up relocating abroad, uh, even just uh, musically, like Orlando Le Fleming, the bass player, and Johnny Screet, good examples who, who've made a big success in, in New York. But that was more... Uh, performance sort of life rather than an academic life but uh, yeah they, there's kind of no no rules really Lo lots of people feel and Burgoyne went to Switzerland for studies and uh, and obviously uh, Trish Clues a brilliant saxophonist has just completed her PhD in Birmingham as well so there there seems to be a route people are exploring more and more you know great and Jeremy, postgraduate? Yeah, I mean, it's really interesting the different walks of life people come from for mm. postgraduate. And uh, I like the idea that somebody um, who was maybe persuaded to do um, uh, something academic and not go for a conservatoire undergraduate course, but they were 
they they've sort of now they've done their degree and they think right i'm going to go <laughs> now i'm going to go to a conservatory and they come you know may have done a degree in modern languages or a, or um or a music academic uh, rather than a conservatory and then they they sort of want a, a postgrad to finish off um, and that, that's uh, that's really healthy. Just so people do come from different routes, it's really important you keep your playing up throughout all that time because yeah. you've, you've got to jump in at a very senior level when you come on a postgrad. So uh, it's um, so it's uh, yeah, that's that's it's really uh, so that it's really healthy to inject those people within the undergraduate scene as well because they've come from different backgrounds. But yeah, I mean, we've had people, I mean, postgrads are generally used, I think. Um, I don't think it's a cynical move at all, but just, just to jump in on a new scene, to get connections in a new city. So uh, yeah, the postgrad abroad is is very popular with our lot. Um, you know, they like to, there's been some people doing Manhattan School of Music or um, The Hague or Berlin seems quite popular. Um, um, and that's yeah, it's a great way to uh, to to crack open a, a new scene. I mean, we have one of our clarinetists. Um, she did a Erasmus visit uh, for a, a term when she was with us, she did just one semester in Hamburg, and uh, made all her connections there. And then she auditioned for their postgrad when she finished with us, and then uh, uh, she's doing great. She lives in Hamburg now. And she's off. She's doing all sorts of really exciting concerts and tours and things. So. Um, often we get youngsters, so there are two things that I've noticed, sort of two additional patterns. One is that there's a lot of, 90% um, of, as you know, and 90% of the summer school go straight to conservatoire. The other 10% tend to go off to do more maths-based, sort of maths and physics-based subjects. Oh. And, um, and then when I've asked them, you know, why did you choose to do that? Um, and obviously they say that they're going to then go off and do postgraduate jazz afterwards. And so I'm asking why, why that way around? And it was only a couple of years ago that one of them uh, who was actually, you know, in the Young Jazz Musician of the Year competition and played to a very high level said, well, the subject maths, I can, I can carry my music on while I'm studying maths, but I can't study, I can't carry my maths on while I'm studying music. So often they do choose to go and do a non music yeah. degree with the intent to go and do the postgraduate afterwards but I'm also wondering if um so when youngsters also say to me oh I didn't get into a college in London or I'm not going to Birmingham you know uh, for my undergraduate course it's like well don't worry about it because there are those postgraduate opportunities and it's an indication of you're not there yet and there's this work to be done I'm wondering within the four years is there any transfer into the degree sort of statistically do you get many youngsters that come and join you sort of second or third year. Um, Jeremy? Uh, very rarely we we get someone entering into year two and, and it's usually because they've done another music program elsewhere and by the end of their first year there they've decided that they're you know they want something more intensive in the jazz area rather than a broader base music degree so occasionally we jump people into year two but it is is very very rare and, and we we don't take people into year three or four. Um, right. Yeah. So you can jump in at what universities call level five, if, but you, you do have to have what they call prior accreditation. <laughs> so you have to show that you were, would have the equivalent of the level four credits. So either through a diploma or the other study that you've done in that year. Yeah. Um, you know, or you have to do various assessments for us um, to prove that you've got to that level. So have you seen many take a year out and then re-audition after? That's a really common thing is that people who don't get in first time, they quite often take a year out and come back and, and wow us the second time around. <laughs> really gratifying. And um, but also, you know, within a program, because it's a four year program at undergraduate, then there's some people take a gap year within that. So they do the first two years, then they have a year off um, back at home or to, to shed. Uh, and then they come back and finish off year three and four bit later so yeah it's kind of uh, uh, quite open in that respect I, li I like that aspect of a modern degree you know you can jump in and out to a certain extent so if they don't get in the first time the doors aren't shut I think people do take it they interpret it like that so it's really lovely that we've got this opportunity to share that it's not the case with them yeah. um, Nick wondering if you've had many um, people come in within you know second or third year or the other way around sort of take like we say take some time out or go and do Erasmus 
Yeah, you you see all of those things rarely, but uh, but consistently happen. There's a fantastic saxophonist there now who who transferred into year two, having completed a first year on a university course. So it does happen, but um, and we'd basically look at any uh, anything on a case by case basis, really, if because everyone's prior sort of experience is unique and may or may not work and we'll try and look at it as positively as we can the only thing i'd say i would uh, exercise some caution or at least be be really uh, deeply considerate about the the thing of if you don't get into one of your preferred places but you have some offers and you think no i i won't go this year I have seen that when, especially when I was running Junior Academy, the the Saturday morning thing, I did see that backfire a few times with really, uh, you know, unfortunate consequences. And I, I do think it's worth remembering that anywhere you go can be a, as amazing as you make it and what you put into it. And don't necessarily fall for the for the idea that the conservatoire x y or z will in itself be your answer and your motivation that does have to come within and i'd sooner see someone take up a place make a massive success of it and have a brilliant time and come back for postgrad mm. than than reappear the following christmas having just been at home practicing and i mean good luck to them whichever way they choose but i do think it's important to to know if it if it doesn't go your way a second time you could feel really lost then because that's suddenly you're looking at two years of of just kind of home practice and you know so i do think that's worth get some advice on that if you find yourself in in that position you know because as you both said as well the fact that the college that offered you a place don't sort of diminish that that means they resonated with what you offered on the day and that, yeah. that partnership might be the next step like you say and then postgraduates always there as an option as well yeah if you wanted to be in a different city or something but all of the courses are run by such caring people with amazing young musicians in great scenes so there's there's something extremely positive to be taken from anywhere you go so so long as you're approaching it in that spirit and with that in mind, because um, especially, you know, I remember when Graham ran the course at the Academy and was, I think it's 30 years now, it's just celebrated. Yeah, just the, over, yeah. Yeah, and then when um, Jeremy and myself, both in 1999, started the jazz courses up when we had Trinity and Birmingham, you know, now that's 20 years, uh, 21 years ago now as well. So they're, like you say, the courses themselves are established and they've got their sort of... Um, what way of doing things within the conservatoire and I think the actual pedagogy the way that we learn and the way that we st is much more at home in the conservatoires because you know they've that's evolved as well so I'm just wondering now the impact and the influence of the programs on the scene itself you know there's a we, we see the presence of all the youngsters that we've worked with are now significant a large percentage are significant members of the jazz scene and I'm wondering what do you make of the new young sort of jazz scene as it is now and uh, what excites you about it jeremy well yeah there's just a, an amazing burgeoning of incredible talent out there and uh, i think the um conservatoire scene has really sort of uh, uh been an incredible catalyst for all of that and it really brought people on i think there's a real sense of community around um the connections between our respective scenes and the conservatoires. So I think one of the criticisms or one of the warnings uh, when conservatoires started embracing jazz was that it, it would over academicize the music and it would um, it would sort of snuff it out uh, the, the sort of street elements and the folk element of it, the lifestyle element that's so that's so important. And the oral tradition so i think we all took that on board and we really took that to heart and and um you know i've i've been constantly uh, aware that i really need to reach out to the scene and feel that the scene is integrated with us and that there's so you you staff it with people who are 
who are really active jazz musicians and um, and then you you provide more public platform for their work next to the student work so so that it is all connected in so it does feel like an integrated scene it's not a separate ivory tower scenario you know that's it's obviously really important and I think we've all been really successful at that because you know if you go to a conservatoire now then you're you're going to bump into some amazing jazz musicians just in queuing up for a coffee or something and that's a it's a really helpful thing for us all feeling connected to um, what was hitherto called the establishment but, uh, but also you know yeah. what you're saying about that sort of that fear is then but we're the people that are doing it we aren't stuffy academics and so by realizing that the practitioners i think the conservatoires and, and the scene itself has relaxed a little bit and seen yeah. you know, like you say that intent and the love of the music and how to facilitate that and no and lots of nurturing and supporting as well rather than dictating what needs to be done like you say so mm. very bespoke and nick one of the questions um as well just come up was about A-level music for both of you. It'd be interested to know, as well as the scene, what do you think of the music education scene as well, and how that's changed. And I know when we, Nick and I, we once did a thing in Norwich, and as we came out of the building, I remember you saying in the car park, "Actually, what we are doing here isn't jazz; it's musicianship." And uh, I think a lot of the youngsters not only enjoy the music making from the sort of the repertoire, but they're really so glad that there's somewhere they can actually really dig deep and develop their musicianship. Because there's uh, one of the questions that came in is. Uh, um, the youngster saying I can't access A-level music so can I actually audition if I haven't got A-level music and we've seen that go down by 50 percent you know of, of the youngsters when we first started the three of us with NYJC so when it started 13 years ago nobody said they couldn't access A-level or GCSE and now in the auditions 50 percent of the youngsters say they can't access A-level or GCSE so how does that impact I was actually at a conversation with um, Julian Lloyd Webber and Nick um, Gib, um, talking about that, you know, with the Department of Education about a year ago, but we didn't really get a satisfactory answer as of yet. So uh, what's the policy on the conservatoires if you haven't got an A-level music, Nick? I don't remember what the exact requirements are. I think that, again, if it, it would be audition first. And if, if, you're, if you're accepted on your audition, we'd try to find a way around that if it had been a if it had been a problem and that might be by demonstrating some prior equivalency in your musical experience that could that could work around it so i i think if the if the desire was there to take you in we'd we'd work together to to try and achieve that but i i don't remember the exact regulation or a, a QCAS level on if, if that is something that's sort of hardwired in but I think more broadly than that the the kind of dismantling of of the access to education over the last 30 odd years I mean I, I just came up through a completely standard Bedfordshire County music system with all my instrumental lessons big band wind band small jazz groups nothing fancy about it at all it was all absolutely provided and amazing and the way that's been just taken away piece by piece we're seeing in every aspect of of the student bodies now and, and especially when we talk about something that means an awful lot to us is the diversity of and the range of students who have access to these opportunities and very often they're being uh, held back by a system that doesn't value the arts and access to arts education. Doesn't see that it can be beyond what it is, which is a, like a human training, a professional skills training. A, it's about finding yourself as a person, finding your confidence and your ability to express yourself. And they, it's sad and and short-sighted that this is we're, we're now seeing the end result quite deeply embedded in in culture as as to how available the arts are across the board we get a lot of the young musicians over the last few months have been so grateful to us continuing things online because wow. 
you know, they keep coming back repeatedly saying there is no music provision from the school or the music service and that they're constantly being um, the provided core topics, core subjects. And I keep pointing out to people, no, no, music for all of the youngsters that we're working with, music is the core, it's their mm -hmm. very core. You can't separate the two out. So I'm, I'm wondering uh, at Birmingham if the, the other thing that the question said was actually would grade eight th theory or be, so be something to consider. So. Um, I think maybe, like you say, it's something to talk to registry about when you're making the actual application. Is it just like yeah. but there are there? Everyone's fully aware of the fact that A level is less and less available. So exactly, it is something yeah. you know that's going that the conservatories are going to have to think about. I'm just wondering if it's something that's cropped up for you, uh, Jeremy, at Birmingham with the people auditioning and saying I haven't got A level music. Yeah, I think there's quite a degree of flexibility. Again, like Nick, I'd have to check with our admissions department what the rules are right now. But yeah. um, I, I think there are point systems and equivalence uh, qualifications to A-level that would definitely be accepted. And, uh, you know, we go on audition first and foremost, and then we can advise how to move forward from that if, they're, if the benchmarks aren't achieved on the points and so forth. And th there's usually something you can do to get that. Yeah, it is, um, yeah it's getting increasingly hard to, to find somewhere that offers A-level as a matter of, matter of course for music, which is a... Great shame. What we really need is more, uh, more jazz uh, graduates um, being prepared to move into teaching situations and being em embraced by uh, mainstream education as part of what they do. So back to how we opened, you know, talking about the creative entrepreneur, there'd be some teaching within the stuff that you do on a weekly or monthly basis. There needs to be some, you know, a lot more work done to allow access of fantastic graduate musicians of ours to get into school level teaching as well so um, yeah that's that's super important um, we, um, that reminds us that we've run we've run an um, ambassador scheme which we've been running for the last few years and we've got a cohort of eight young musicians at the moment that are working with us we're actually focusing that one in, in the midlands because we realize that some of the musicians we work with want to stay geographically you know living in certain areas not just automatically traveling to london and and seeing that their portfolio career is going to take place here. So we are also in partnership with the East Midlands building up a creative hub. So that, that worked really nicely. And we, even though we're online, we've been, we've continued that online and they're supporting next week as well. So uh, it's Thanks. a great opportunity. So anyone that is interested in doing that, then you can actually find out more about it. If you sign up to my newsletter, I'm not going to sign off and I have got one more question for both of you, but I'm going to ask my dear colleague, Nick Brown, who is a graduate from the, Birmingham, Royal Birmingham Conservatoire and did NYJC. Uh, I'd like you to come and just explain how you sign up for the newsletter and also if you'd like to donate because as you can tell we're very passionate about the work we do and there are a lot of young musicians who might be coming from a background at the moment that can't afford to pay for the fees although we try and keep things really down to a minimum so we have got a, a really strong bursary scheme and that subsidizes a third of the youngsters enrollment fees every year so over to you Nick because you've got a, a lovely style of knowing what the uh, catchphrase <laughs> is go for fingers it fingers crossed fingers crossed I mean, if you want to sign up for our newsletter, it's nationalyouthjazz.co.uk forward slash sign up. If you would like to donate, it's nationalyouthjazz.co.uk forward slash donate. And then if you want to rewatch uh, all the previous hashtag National Youth Jazz Wednesdays, you can go to nationalyouthjazz.co.uk forward slash online dash resources. Brilliant. So yeah. and join us on Sunday right through to next Friday at five o'clock online because we're doing this mini summer school. So there'll be lots of headlines to share. So do make sure that you follow us and the newsletter will tell you about a lot of things that's happening from September onwards. And there'll be some special things that only newsletter people that have signed up for newsletters will be invited to take part in as well. Um, as we sign off, I'm just wondering from both of you, because I know how passionate you are about the music, about the scene and about the young people as well. So I wondered if we might finish with, from both of you, uh, a little testimonial about why you're both staying in the role that you're doing. What is it about being head of jazz that you both love, being at the Royal Academy of Music and being at the Royal Birmingham Conservatoire? So Nick, might you sign us off first of all with your sharing your insight and your love of it all? Of course, no. It's uh, I, I've not uh, been doing this quite as long as as Jeremy at Birmingham, but this was just uh, last month, my sort of ten year anniversary 
in the role. But you know, I consider it. I mean, all um, uh, joking aside, and in all uh, genuineness, uh, the most incredible uh, privilege and honour to sort of hold that position. And the the students are without question the uh, the thing that make it as amazing as it is, and the the sense of of kind of family and community that that's built up around their activity both while they're students and afterwards and the relationships they form with the staff and the the kind of overall sense of belonging that it generates is a is an, a, a constant and ongoing inspiration really and i'm i'm forever grateful for that and I know they all high, hold you in high regard as well and really appreciate all that you do for them. So, and NYJC is really grateful to all that you do for both the Royal Academy and what you've been doing. Well, thank you. And before well, so. I sign off, just to say a massive thanks to you and NYJC for, for what's properly incredible work. And, it, and it's hard to imagine a time really not that long ago when this didn't exist at all so your efforts in in establishing it and making it the force it's become is is just massive and will uh, will be there always you know so yeah thanks loads for having me and anyone who's watching it's probably just me mum left watching now but anyway, <laughs> thanks everybody that she's dead proud <laughs> jeremy why are you doing what you're doing what is it that you love and has made you stay it's just the opportunity to make such a difference really i mean it's uh conservatoires are the whole higher education system uh and conservatoires within that they're, they're just a, such an amazing resource for uh, mobility of the students and uh and just the, the cultural impact you can have the contribution you can make from from this position is is really awesome it's a wonderful opportunity and a great privilege to be uh, to be uh, leading it or just uh, being amongst all the people who want to be around it as well that's uh, that's a really uh, fantastic um, privilege just to um, have that sense of community uh, moving forward but yeah the ob objectives are aesthetic you know it's it's about art it's about music and it's about the truth that you can get from being involved in art in a, in a deep level and it's it's really highly addictive so once you <laughs> sort of get into this role of um, you know rejecting all of this it's really hard to move away from it so um, yeah it's a wonderful thing to be involved in and again i know that all your students and your staff hold you in high regard and really appreciate all that you're doing and the fact that both courses haven't stayed static that you're constantly moving it pushing it forward which is so important because of the nature of the scene you know it's not a static music so yeah. thank you both of you for all that you're doing and also on a personal level huge amount of thanks for you know really the support that you've given because as you can imagine starting something from nothing um, even though you, you're confident that there is the need for it it's a mm. lot of hard work and I have really drawn great strength from both of you and a lot of wisdom as well so thank you both of you a lot I'm looking forward to um, welcoming everybody on Sunday at five o'clock to the mini summer school that we're doing. We're actually going to be talking to Julie and Joseph at the end of the day and doing a bit of a sharing about some of the things that we've been doing. We're working with uh, Michael Price, who's written a lot of TV music for um, Sherlock and Unforgotten and the current Dracula. And then Olga Fitzroy, who's worked a lot on The Crown and um, is the Coldplay uh, producer and engineer as well so we're looking at the sort of the more production side of things as well and then there'll be some conversations with um, London Jazz News and a few of the promoters sort of small um, festivals like the uh, Ribble Valley and then larger festivals like Gateshead and Sage Gateshead and then the other uh, heads of department will be joining us a week tomorrow so from Scotland and Wales and London um, I'm hoping Leeds will join us as well it's the only one that hasn't responded to our invitation but could be holidays and everything and then on the Friday, we will sign off with all of the tutors just sharing what we've done during the week. It's not the end of a week. It will be the beginning of more future projects. So we're hoping to eventually be able to play together live. And all the work that they're doing next week is to get that repertoire together, ready for when the shooter's pistol goes and we can all run to the next venue, get together, play live and either share it as a live stream or to share it uh, with a live audience. But I know all three of us, and Nick included, 
we feel such a passion for the music and the community and they're kind of inseparable in a way and um, we will always be championing the music and helping make it happen so whether we're online or whether we're in person well I think from all of us we'd like to wish you a lovely evening and we very much hope to see you at the next projects we're doing thank you very much Nick Smart thank you very much brilliant to be here oh it's lovely and also Jeremy Price thanks very much Aziz wonderful to be here thanks and we'll see you very soon, either online or in person. Yeah. Mine's the first round, by the and way. Very best wishes to everyone for the for the online summer school Sunday. I hope you have a really brilliant time and, and good on you for making that happen under these circumstances. So say hi to everyone. Brilliant. And uh, we'll see you again, both of you, very soon. And very much looking forward to seeing you in person as well. So yeah. the first opportunity. See you all very soon. Don't forget to donate and go to the website. We could really do with some of your help at the moment. Have a lovely evening. Signing off. Ciao. Okay.